we were working on this IMU here, the BNO055. And um, I think last week we discussed how this sensor acts as kind of uh, all-in-one uh, sensor fusion uh, IMU. So it's got a gyroscope in it, it's got an accelerometer in it, and I'm pretty sure it has a magnetometer as well from memory. Yes, it does, because um, they call it a nine degree of freedom system, uh, a sensor. So you've got three axes from the um, accelerometer, which are all, all your accelerations in each axis. You've got three axes, three axis at um, your, your magnetometer, which is your orientation, and you've got three axis gyroscope, which is your angular velocity. And what it, it actually turns out that this chip has a M M naught CPU in it. Um, I, I think it's an it's like an ARM CPU, but basically what it does is it has this kind of like little Kalman filter within it, or whatever they use. It might be like a complementary filter, but it's combining all of these uh, measurements together, and it spits out. Uh, Quaternions, it spits out Euler angles, Euler axis, your gravity vector. It does all of the processing for you. So it's really nice chip to work with. I've changed a bit of the schematic from last week. I think I cleaned things up a bit. Um, but basically, we still just have our ITC lines here, our pull up resistors, um, capacitors, everything's pulled down to ground to make sure that the ITC lines are activated. And we've got a decoupling capacitor here. So I think last week I was going from the data sheet, but a good tip if you're going to do these sorts of things is um, there's a company called Adafruit, which you will like to familiar yourself with. And basically, I'm oh, not their GitHub. What they do is produce breakout boards for these kind of sensors. So for example, here, this is a breakout board which allows you to easily interface with the sensor. Now, last week we we're looking at the data sheet for the sensor. We're looking at what components you have to place around it. But Adafruit basically do this for you. So one option is you can purchase this and create a PCB which has all of the headers in the right spot. So you can basically just connect your V in straight to like a, a little pin using pins like this. You can just solder them to your PCB and then solder it to this here. And it will all plug in all nice and you won't have to do any of this extra um yeah any of this extra stuff to get that working on your pcb but what we want to do is basically learn how to build this pcb and build build it into our own um our own flight computer so what adafruit actually do you can go to their website and normally for all of these breakout boards they actually just publish the schematic um public here publicly so you can just look up pretty much any sensor that they sell. And um, normally on their downloads page, you can see here that here, you have this schematic available to you. So you can pretty much copy this. Um, I wouldn't necessarily just copy it blindly, but it's kind of a good introduction to how you can build these schematics for yourself. So here they have all of the capacitors right, they have an external oscillator, which um, we're not going to do today, but I haven't really figured out if this is a necessary thing right now, but um, it might very well be. And then the only weird thing that they have going on here is they have a 3.3 volt linear regulator. So this is stepping down when you input five volts. Um, that's too high for the sensor because it runs at 3.3 volts. So you'll, you'll uh, fry it if you put five volts into it. You step it down to three volts um, and then that's going to run into here using this chip. And all of this weirdness going on here with the um, MOSFETs and the diode, this is so that when you're working with the um, chip here, this uh, on the ITC lines is spinning out three volts or zero. That's kind of the threshold. That's um, yeah, the, the high and low for the dial lines. And this is stepping it up to five volts, um, which is just a kind of a, a standard. It, I guess it steps it up to whatever your input voltage is, but these breakout boards are normally rated for five volts, so you input five volts. Um, so it's just shifting the logic level up to a voltage that you know you're inputting. But I, I kind of looked at this and I changed our schematic to match it for the most part, minus this oscill uh, oscillator here. And then after we did that, we worked on the schematic. Um, and last week it didn't go too great. 
I'll admit. Um, but I touched it up and it's a lot nicer. So once this loads, you can have a look at maybe a better way to route these kinds of um, boards. So we'll just wait for it to load. It's going to be a bit slow. Um, so actually in the meantime, what we're going to do, oh, it's loaded. Yeah, it gets pretty messy. <laughs> but this kind of thing is all right. So this is our chip here. Um, if you remember last week, we imported it and all of the um, parts, there's like little rat lines that are connecting the pad to the pad on the chip that we want to draw the connection between. And so one of the big tasks is just arranging everything around the chip so that um, you can route things easily. And feel free to, you know, you can run traces underneath the chip. But for the most part, I, I think it'll be fine for something like this. Sometimes you want to just have a big ground um, pour beneath the chip just for stability or, or whatever it is, but I don't think it's really too necessary at the moment. Um, but this is how I ended up doing it. One of the things is, oh, um, on the bottom side, so this big green part, this is called a ground pour. So it's one really big, um, it's like a trace, but it's a big pour of copper. So normally these little lines here, this is all copper that they put along uh, little lines. But this green is one big pour of copper. And we have that connected to ground. Now for PCB design, one of the most important things is how you ground everything. And having a big ground pour like this is pretty much essential if your um, system is going to work well. So one big ground plane kind of allows you to have um, just like consistent grounding between all of the components. So if you just like round little wires but between the grounding, you're going to get what's called like parasitic inductance, parasitic capacitance. These are all problems that are very hard for like a beginner to grasp but you can avoid them usually by just having a big ground pour. So I th the way you do that is you click this add field zone button here, and then you just like draw out, all right, you click, and then you say, all right, I want this to be on the ground layer. So B copper is your bottom layer, and I want it to be a ground um, net connected to the ground net. Boom, you can just like draw whatever shape and then just double click. And then that's your ground pour there. Um, it's probably shaped like that because I didn't do it on the edge cut. Oh no, boom. Yeah. But it's all right if it kind of looks like this. I think you can press like E on it. It's moving. Yeah, it's fine. Now, once you have a ground pour, uh, another concept that you want to get used to is what's called a VR or via, via, it's basically a little hole that goes from the top layer of your board to the bottom. So you can imagine that this chip is sitting on the top layer. All of these um, traces are running on the top layer. All the copper is just running between the different pins, connecting everything together. And then you want to connect, um, you know, for example, here, your three volts input to ground, right? So this capacity here is providing stability for the chip. Um, and once you connect it to ground, you want to connect it to uh, the ground of the whole system. So what we can do is just chuck this via here. The way that you do that is when you're routing a wire like this, you can just tap V and that will bring up a via and it's going to go to the other layer and you can keep routing on the bottom layer. So I actually don't want that. And now look, everything's disappeared, but that's because over here, this little blue arrow is pointing at the bottom copper layer. So we click there and we're back. So I'm just going to, oops, click on that, delete it, delete it, delete it. And I sort of have this. So basically what this button here, it just removes the, um, the infill for the ground pour. Now, normally you don't want to route too, ma too many things um, on your copper or on your ground pour, because you're going to be um, splitting up the ground uh, how like consistent the ground is and you can cause new problems called ground loops, which can also mess up your sensors and um, normally more at high frequency things, but I'm sure that it can really like um, hurt you. 
you know, if you're not aware of it. So I try and keep my traces on the bottom layer very short. A problem that I often run into is routing I2C um, lines because you need a pull-up resistor to pull it up to 3.3 volts, um, as you can see here, these resistors here. And normally that makes it quite a hard, um, it's, it's quite hard to, to route these traces out to where you want. So for example, I wanted to connect this pad here to 3.3 volts. I would run the connection here on the top layer. And then you can see SDA would be blocked by this 3.3 volt um, wire that would be running across here. So normally uh, you have to run one of the I2C lines on the bottom layer, but you can see here it's really short. It's not really gonna um, make any difference to the, the ground pour because it's so big. So these two lines here are just going to run off to like a connector or something. They'll just run off to the rest of your I2C bus and you can connect it to your microcontroller. You can connect it to other sensors. Um, it's pretty versatile. So if we look at this in 3D, remember you can hold Alt and press 3 or um, hit View and then 3D Viewer. We can see what it looks like in 3D. Oops. So this is our chip with our pull-up resistors, our decoupling capacitors. Um, I think that's that resistors for something. I don't know. I'll just check the schematic here. There we go. Oh, it's another pull-up resistor. Yep. And then these traces are going to run off to you know whatever we want to connect this to. And you can see all the vias or vias, the little little tunnels, and it basically connects your top layer all the way to the bottom layer. So now if we look on the bottom layer. Um, the, this end of the VR is just connected to this uh, slightly different green, which is a copper pore. It's where all the ground connections are. And this is our little 3.3 volt voltage, which is running under one of the I2C lines. So yeah, um, that's basically what we did last week and we, we got everything nice and cleaned up. But this week I'll show you um, all of this here, which I've slowly started to add to our fly computer. And I'll go through all of the different aspects of this. Um, now, it's a, a big step up from what we initially did, but um, yeah, it's it's week six and it's good to get an intro to this and just, you know, if you're gonna do some more research on your own, this is a good place to start. So over the past few days, um, I was figuring out, I was trying to identify what exactly we need our flight computer to do. Um, and so this is a, uh, a program called Miro. We use this a lot at the Melbourne Space Program to do um, like collaborative brainstorming. Everybody can kind of jump on this board um, and just post notes everywhere and everyone can you know discuss or do a retro or yeah, just brainstorm what they need to do. But I was thinking about what, what exactly we need uh, the flight computer for uh, and the capabilities that it needs to you know be successful in flight. So some of the things I thought of, um, it's important to do this because then you can draw a connection between your needs and uh, what solutions or what, what components on the board will satisfy the, the needs. It's a very simplified version of doing um, like requirements for a system. It's like stripped down system engineering. Um, yeah, but basically it, it's really good to organize things like this. So some of the things I identified that our flight computer needs to do. First of all, we want it to detect Apogee. Um, this is primarily because Apogee is the height of height that your rocket flies to. It's basically where your velocity hits zero in the up direction and it will start to fall back to Earth. So, you know, very important to know exactly how high we flew. As part of that, we want to sense all of the forces and the torques um, and whatever else is acting on the rocket. This is important to verify that our design worked or you know, maybe if something goes wrong in flight, we can look back at the logs and the data that we recorded from the flight and try and identify what went wrong. Um, so this is very important. You can also, with the forces, you can uh, calculate the acceleration acting on the rocket. And from the acceleration, you can integrate that to also have an estimate of how high the rocket flew. We want to save this data um, from each flight. We want to save it in some way that we can view it on the computer, on a computer. Um, 
So for that, we want some reliable memory, uh, reliable way to store this data. We want it to be relatively low cost. Uh, flight computers can get pretty expensive, um, you know, if you want it really state of the art, but we'll try to keep it as low cost as possible for now. Uh, we want it to be expandable. Uh, that may, may, may it's more of like a one. I want it to be expandable just because once you order a PCB and you say, oh, there's like this really cool sensor that I want to interface with it. For it to be expandable, we can just make sure that there's an I2C plug on the side of the board. And so then we can just plug in whatever sensor we want to add to it. Um, not really a need, but yeah, it's a, it's a one. Now a rocket also has to activate staging devices. So that might be um, activating the main parachute or activating like a, a, a drogue chute to slow it down before it activates the main chute. Or even, you know, people, people see, um, you see people these days doing like motor swaps. You know, something I've seen recently. So there's a channel on YouTube called BPS space. He does a lot of work with thrust vector control model rocketry. Really, really cool. It basically encompasses everything that an engineer would get excited about. Um, control systems, mechanical design, electrical design. Um, and basically what he's doing at the moment is he has an ascent motor, which flies the rocket up. And on the way down, as it's falling, it spits out that motor, um, ignites another one, and he's trying to land the rocket with it. So the SpaceX style. Um, landing rockets. It's kind of crazy, but we can just think of it as activating a parachute for now. We want a way to warn the user whether the flight computer is armed, if the rocket's ready to take off, uh, and we want to power it from a battery. So, uh, you know, if there's more needs, there probably is, but this is kind of what I initially thought is a good place to start. Um, this would make a good flight computer uh, in any, uh, any sort of capacity. Uh, we can move on to the ones. I'll just go over this quickly. So like something I'm interested in the moment is the CAN bus. This is a, this is like I2C. It's a protocol for sensors to communicate with each other, but it's like automotive grade. So it's very, 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 very robust, very far. Uh, yeah, pretty. Yeah. I'd say very fast. Um, just very robust. And a lot of organizations are moving to use using CAN in uh, like aerospace. There's something called UAV CAN, which a lot of drones are using at the moment. So it's a good learning experience, but uh, it's not really a need, but I want to add CAN. Thrust vector, <laughs> thrust vector control is obviously really, really cool. Um, it helps you with stability in flight. So it's basically it angles the motor um, to keep the rocket straight as it flies up. Probably not. Yeah, oh yeah, it, it's pretty legal. It probably wouldn't work with like really high power rocketry at the moment unless you have a really, really solid uh, way of doing it, but this comes into the idea of this being expandable. So, you know, if we can make it so that servos can be attached to control the thrust vectoring, that'd be, that'd be great. It's just a one there. GPS would be cool. Um, just so we can see exactly where the rocket is at all times and live tele telemetry. So these are pretty advanced topics. Live telemetry is, would be really hard. You need some kind of radio as part of the, the flight computer to that to really work um but you know these are just nice things to have but given all that so kind of the things that we want to put on the board on the flight computer we want these sensors accelerometer gyroscope barometer um and i guess magnetometer is part of the bno 055 so that's just an added bonus but this will give us all the information to verify that our flight or our rocket worked essentially you can look over it again. We can simulate with the data that we get from this. We can see exactly what went on in flight or when, what went wrong in the flight to improve the design. So this is pretty much essential to have, to, to add. Uh, SD card. So this is something, um, oops, these two things kind of go together. So to save data for analysis and to have reliable memory, um, saving data, it makes sense to just use an SD card. You can put it in, you can take it out, you can observe all the data, get it on your computer, it's super easy. But the issue with SD cards in rocket flight is an SD card makes a mechanical connection to your board. 
you know, you just insert it, you plug it into the little uh, connector and it just sits there. What rockets, what makes rockets a difficult environment to design for is that there's very, very high force, like high G forces acting on the rocket and there's massive vibrational loads that it has to tolerate as well. And since SD cards make a mechanical connection, there's every chance that in those vibrations, you could have a disconnect, um, maybe when you're writing to the SD card. And that's very bad because you can in fact corrupt the entire memory of the SD card when that kind of thing happens. And so this is a pretty well-known issue. Um, and what people have come up to overcome this issue is to have a, a little chip on the board, which is dedicated flash memory. And so this chip will be soldered to the board which is a much stronger connection than a mechanical SD card slot. And in flight, you're logging everything. You're saving that data to this flash chip. You're writing it all there. And then once the rocket comes back and lands on the ground, it can verify that it's not going to be experiencing any high G forces anymore. It will then dump all of the memory in the flash to the SD card. And so this is, this works really well. Um, you have a pretty safe way to store data this way. And it's also a very good, um, yeah, good experience to do this sort of thing, interfacing with memory, writing to memory, um, and, you know, doing some like more memory management style things. So that's the plan. We're going to have an external flash memory chip, and then we're going to write it to the SD card once the, the rocket lands. Now for all of the processing for writing to the, the flash memory to read reading the sensors, um, we're going to use an STM32. This I wouldn't say is a entry level device. Um, it's, it's, I guess kind of like Arduino. I think you can even program it with an Arduino core so that you can write Arduino code and it will run on the STM32. But what we're going to be using at least in this is the ST cube. IDE. So actually, oops. it might be a good idea if you want to program these STM32s like bare metal style, just search up STM32 cube IDE, click here and download the, um, the IDE. So I just did that before the workshop and it's just kind of successfully completed. And this allows you to set up, um, all of the peripherals that you're going to be using on the STM32, and then it allows you to program it with uh, C. So all, all the code is going to be C that we'll be writing. Oops. But the advantage is STM32s are very, very cheap, and they're very, very high performance. Um, so if you want to do things like thrust vector control, you want a really tight control loop. For example, like um, I've had like 30 hertz sort of control loop is is good enough for thrust vector control and typically you want a processor that can operate above 20 megahertz probably like 40 50 60 megahertz um, and these stm32s that we're going to be using the f4s i was just looking at them you can clock them up to like 168 megahertz um, with these fo405s um, but I made a little mistake and I don't think we're going to be using these ones because it turns out um, the one that I've put here and I've actually already filled out the, so um, I, I guess just an in intro brand and then F4 is an indicator. There's like F0, F1, F2, F3, F4. It's an indicator that's a high performance chip. So if you go on the STM website, you can see STM32 F4 series. This is what we want to use. High performance MCUs. Um, and I put in a 405 or STM32 F4 05. And apparently there's a medical grade if I click. Here, yeah, designed for medical industrial consumer applications. So, I mean, we don't need that. So that's more popular is the F0, uh, the 401, which is what I'm going to be swapping over today. So here we go. You can clock it up to 84 megahertz. So that's going to be fine for pretty much any single application that you, you're going to want. 
And then these chips are like three dollars, four dollars, or something like incredibly cheap. So that's why we're going to be using STM thirty twos. Uh, pyro channels. So a pyro is how we're going to activate our staging devices. So for example, um, you might ignite some black powder to blow out your parachute. You could cut a um, cut like a rubber band to throw out your parachute. Um, some people, I think, for AURC, our, our rocket team. They're looking at CO2 ignition, but you need a way to trigger that ignition. And so the way that we're going to do it basically is, um, at least for now, using a piece of nichrome wire. And when you run a current through it, it gets really red hot and you can use that to cut like a rubber band or whatever, whatever it is. And that's going to actuate our deployment device. So this is going to allow us to stage, um, and that's this circuit here. So I'll explain this in a minute, but let's just go through the rest of this. Um, a buzzer and LED, this is just for user feedback. Um, so a buzzer, you know, when you turn the flight computer on, it can just like spit a few like sounds at you and say like, oh, hello, I'm awake. Or, you know, when, when it's like doing the countdown to launch, it can be and just like keep people away. LEDs are fun, really easy to use. So we'll chuck them on. Um, that's some good user feedback. And now to power it from battery, we're gonna want a voltage regulator. So I'm still deciding what kind of battery we want to use. Um, quick intro to LiPo batteries. A, a LiPo battery is typically, um, has a voltage of about 3.7 volts, I think. Um, so it kind of makes sense that 3.7 volts would work for our STM32, because this runs at 3.3 volts. So we can easily step down 3.7 volts to 3.3 volts and everyone will be happy. But I'm thinking long term, um, if you want to do like dust vector control or control some sort of motor to do a reaction wheel, you know, just to open up options, we we'll want something called a 2S LiPo, which is basically two LiPo batteries stacked on top of each other. And that will typically spit out like 7.4 volts um, nominally. So to make that usable with our circuit, we have to go from 7.4 volts down to 3.3 volts. Um, and there's a few different ways to do that, but um, yeah, we'll discuss the two options when we get around to it, but this is gonna be a very important thing to power our whole system. And so we're gonna need a voltage regulator. So there's probably some things I have missed, but this is a good start. This is a massive overview of the crazy different um, things that there are that, that are out there to learn to do this kind of thing. Um, but don't be intimidated, this kind of stuff. As you slowly work through it, it makes more and more sense. It's sort of just like the more time you put into it um, and the more time you're around this kind of like community of um, information, the more you soak in it, it just becomes natural. So don't feel intimidated by all these different things. I, I mean, I don't even know like SD cards, they're still something that I'm trying to learn. However, let's jump in and see all of the circuitry that I've done so far. And if we have time, we'll swap over from this medical grade STM32 to this F01, uh, 401, which is gonna be um, a bit more our standard. Cool. Okay. Sorry if this is a sprint, there is quite a lot to cover, but um, <laughs> I was hoping to actually get to some some routing today, but that might not happen. That might be that might be next week. Oh yeah, and USB programming. Yeah, let's not worry about that for the moment. So let's get stuck into it. Um, last week we did the IMU, and so beyond this, we're going to follow a kind of similar approach to building out the other circuitry um, for the flight computer. So just to take you through what I've done so far. Um, the first thing I added was a USB, um, a USB connector. I added this just so that we can power the flight computer without the need to connect a battery. This is just going to be for like debugging. It's a very nice interface just to, um, work everything out for the moment. And so when we're working through this, let's just assume 
for now that there's no battery involved. We're just powering everything from USB because that's going to be kind of where we build out capabilities and then we can program the, the microcontroller ideally from this, but um, maybe there's a few other options that we can approach. Um, but yeah. For now, USB micro, if you are going to use it for anything else, you don't need these data plus, data minus lines. Um, if you just want to power something from USB, you take V bus, which is at five volts, you connect ground. Apparently you don't want to connect shield to ground. <clears throat> oh, sorry. You don't want to connect shield to ground. Um, but don't quote me on that. I think there's a good reason for it, but do your own research um, for, for that. Anyway, um, that's all there really is to a micro. And we're going to run these differential lines to the STM32 to hopefully program it from the micro USB. Uh, CAN transceiver, I'm not going to talk about that just yet because I want to get a second opinion on it um, because I don't really know how CAN works at the moment. But here, okay, so this is something new. A good barometer to use. So a barometer detects pressure and pressure is proportional to the height at which your rocket is. As you go up from ground level, you're going to have less and less pressure because you know, you're know you approaching the space or whatever. Um, and it's very detectable. So I think these things kind of have a um, <clears throat> resolution of a, a meter or a few meters. This is a popular barometer that's used in rocketry, the BMP280. So when I went to design it, I just did the, um, the little hacky way to do it. I look for the Adafruit. Adafruit schematic. <laughs> so here it is. This, this is like their schematic for it. This little thing in the middle is the pressure sensor. <clears throat> and then all the supporting electronics around it. But we probably don't need most of that. So I looked for the schematic. Here it is. Okay, let's bring it up. And bring it up big so we can see it. So here we go. This is the BMP2280 digital pressure sensor. You can see they didn't even connect anything down here. They just broke out all the lines and so we can copy that VDDI, VDD. Um, and we, ooh, we want to connect this to 3.3 volts. So I just press W, draw a line up there, hit the power port, So now we have 3.3 volts coming in here. Now I have a capacity here, um, 10 UF. You can see that they also put a, a 10 UF capacity here and they also put a 100 nano farad capacity here as well to smooth out some high frequency noise that you might get on the input line. That's probably a good idea. So let's just chuck that in as well. So I'm just gonna press A Type in C small. This is our second capacitor. <clears throat> um, no, I'm going to put it over here. Press E on the words here, and you can just type in 100 nanofarad. Um, so we use 3.3 volts. Primarily because this STM32 <clears throat> runs at 3.3 volts. So I'm trying to keep it pretty standard between everything. I think the reason that it's 3.3 volts is the internal like silicon technology that they use. So I think 3.3 volts is pretty standard of like CMOS technology. Um, and then five volts is like the old technology, which uses some other like some other transistor um, so CMOS will be a type of transistor. They use some older transistor style. So the lower voltage is actually better because it's lower power usage. <clears throat> and I've heard rumors that we're actually slowly switching to like 2.4 volts and then even 1.8 volts. That's becoming like the standard to run these kind of circuitry. This kind of circuitry. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Um, so actually what I normally do is I, these decoupling capacitors is what they're, they're called. 
um, because they basically decouple the power supply from the circuit that you're using. Um, normally put them separate. It's because it makes things a bit nicer. Um, and a good example for that is, oops. Oh, something I figured out is actually if you mouse over something and press G, it stands for grab, and then you can just like move it around with the wires. So all of these VDDs here, you want to decouple them from the power supply. And so you end up with this, all of these capacitors, just to smooth out the power supply for the for the um the chip. So it's good to separate them. We do that here. Um, we just want to connect these. Oops. Only run wires out like this, not directly across, because it can be a bit annoying. Um, and then we want to. I just mouse over and press C to make a copy. There we go. Okay, now we have our decoupling for our barometer here. Um, what else did they have in this circuit? <laughs> so they had their own regulator here. They had a LED to display when the board is on. They had a chip select and an address pin. Ah, we don't have to worry about those. And then here they say that you need pull-up resistors for the ITC line, but you only need one. But generally, you only need one pull-up resistor per I2C bus. And we have them on this sensor here, so it should be all right. So the capacitors in parallel, <coughs> um, for example, here, it's good practice to, for every VDD, this is just something that I was told, if for every VDD, which is a power input to the chip, you're going to have two 100 nanofarad capacitors. And this smooths out. If you have any noise on the voltage line, um, just like really high frequency buzzing, um, a capacitor like this at 100 nanofarad, which is like a ceramic capacitor, will smooth out that noise and just get rid of it. Now, if you have a capacitor like this, <coughs> 10 microfarad, this is a much larger capacitance, might be an electrolytic capa capacitor, and that generally, because it has a higher capacitance, smooths out the lower frequency noises. So when you combine them together in parallel, you're just adding them basically. <clears throat> um, I guess you could argue, so I have eight of them here, I think. One, two, nine. Why don't we just use one 900 nanofarad capacitor? And that's because these VDD are going to be spread out all around the chip, all around the perimeter. And to have a decoupling capacitor work well, you got to put it as close to the VDD pin as is physically possible. Any distance between the pin and the capacitor, you're going to get some inductance and that's going to introduce more noise into the system. So you can imagine VDD like one here, one here, one here, one here. You want to put each of these really close to it. So put one really close here, one really close here, one really close here to smooth out each and individual pin. And then, so I guess the other thing is, why don't we just use 200 nanofarad capacitors? I think it's just a cost thing. 100 nanofarad is probably more popular than 200 nanofarad. Um, and you'll find that's pretty standard with a lot of different um, passive components. There's just like standard sizes that you use. And so rather than, you know, somewhere else, for example, here, where we're using one 100 nanofarad capacitor, it's usually preferable <laughs> to buy in bulk. And so rather than buying one, one, nan, one, one of these and then one 200 nanofarad capacitor, you'd rather just buy three 100 nanofarad capacitors. Um, I think that's kind of like the logic of it. 
cool. So here we go with the barometer. Up. This is going to detect our height for us and just connect over I2C. Okay, um, so before I go on to this, the actual CPU, which we'll try to set up real quick in the 15 minutes we have left. Um, I want to briefly talk about the pyro channel. So this is what basically pulls current from the battery, heats up the nichrome wire to activate um, like a staging device. And so this seems a bit more complicated potentially. Um, it's not too bad. This here is a MOSFET and it kind of acts like an electrical switch. So when this line here is at zero, zero volts, it's not going, going to let any current pass through. So this is going to be like an open circuit. And so you're going to get no current passing through here, no current through the nichrome wire, um, and it's not going to heat up. From the microcontroller, we want to pull this high to like 3.3 volts. That's going to open this switch. And so now current is going to be able to flow through the nichrome wire, through here, through this um, current limiting resistor. So this is just going to ensure that we don't have a short and to ground. So that's what that component there is doing. All of the extra stuff around here, for example, this 470 ohm resistor, um, basically all this is doing is when we pull this low, uh, the gate of the MOSFET is going to have some charge in it still. And, um, basically we want to drain the charge from it so that this is going to turn off. So if we pull this low, there's going to be some charge here and that's going to be able to flow out here through this resistor and turn the gate off. This here is just so that we can sense, um, if, if we're actually supplying voltage or not. Mm, now that I think about it, we might, we should probably put that after the nichrome wire maybe, or after this, uh, that's right. And then this circuit here is, um, it's a bit hard to explain, but essentially what this is doing is preventing when we, when we open, we close this switch, we don't want a direct path of current from ground to the battery. Um, that's going to cause problems. And, you know, if we short a battery, we might make it catch fire. So this capacitor here, basically the current's going to go into this capacitor, charge it up, and then we're going to pull current from it through here. So instead of pulling it directly from the battery, we're pulling it directly from this big capacity here. That's kind of just a safety feature. If you want to learn more about this kind of thing, you can just look up pyro circuits for rocketry. Um, but... All right. So quick and dirty intro now to the STM32. So as I said, we're going to want to get rid of this because this is like medical grade and we don't really want that. Um, we won this FO1 here. So how am I going to do this? Maybe um, I'll just build it off the board here, off the schematic here, and then we can just sub it in. So um, I think, as I said earlier, when you want to download um, this IDE, so the STM32 cube IDE. This allows you to configure the STM32 and write code for it. So I downloaded it earlier. Uh, hopefully it worked. It's about two gig. Um, it's actually a fork. So ST um, is the name of the company. It's a fork of Eclipse, if you've ever used Eclipse. And they added their own sort of features to it. So if you, if you kind of learn how an STM32, um, sure. Works. This is introing you to really need. Here's why I'm, I'm trying to force myself to learn it. Um, but it's also a good idea for, you know, 
um, it's going to be hard, but if you do stick with it and learn, um, it's going to, you know, really prove very useful. <laughs> okay, cool. So here we go. Uh, hmm. Allow access. I might just want to download some documents. I'm right, going to start our new STM32 project. And you'll see what I mean by configuring everything. Basically, we can um, initialize I2C buses. We can initialize what clock we want to run the CPU at. Um, if we want SPI. If we want, where are we at? <clears throat> yeah, can um, our debug lines. And it generates the code that will run on the STM32 to do that for us. What happened? Oh, here we go. <clears throat> so once this initializes, we come to this section where it lists pretty much every STM32 board that you can ever imagine. So we got thousands of them. Um, we've identified that we want to use this uh, F01, 401. Dynamic power, processing performance. Yeah, it's got like, let's say 84 megahertz. And let's just like go all out and get this one here. So got 512 kilobyte of flash, 96 kilobyte um, of RAM. Let's just do it. So we'll just search for that part, STM32, <clears throat> F4, O1, and um, we want, yeah, don't worry too much, but we want this 64 pin LQFP. That's just its footprint. So what we're actually gonna put on the board. Um, we're not gonna have to solder this though because uh, JLC PCB do that for us. So F four O one I E. Beautiful. Okay. So we'll select that. Hit next. Project name. Flight. Computer. V. O one. Type language C. Executable. Yep, that's all good. And yeah, we just hit finish and hit yes, because that's just going to open the right um, view mode for us. So this sets up everything that we could possibly, um, all of the configuration, it generates all the code and it tells you where you can write the code. Um, okay, we got to download. So yeah, th this is essentially all of the library files and the configuration for this exact chip. So for the F4s, there might just be a library to work with. For other ones, um, yeah, they're gonna have their own individual sort of uh, library to use. So while that's loading, let's go back and look here. So this is the medical grade one. Um, now, we talked about the decoupling capacitors before. This is just kind of like standard practice. Every VDD on here um, put to 100 nanofarad. Apparently, it just works pretty well. Now, VDDA, this is kind of like your reference for your analog signals. And analog is a lot more sensitive to noise than uh, digital, which is why people eventually switch to digital. So we want to provide a power supply that's very, very clean and has little to no noise on this pin here um, to act as that reference. So actually, let's go back up to here, our linear regulator. So this um, chip here, essentially what's going on is we have five volts coming on from the USB. We've got a, a diode here. This just prevents reverse polarity. Um, don't worry too much about this. You can just ignore that. 
Then I put a fuse here. So if we exceed 500 milliamps, this fuse is going to blow and going to cut um, uh, power to the circuit. That's just a good way to protect against short circuits. And then this weird thing here. So this is a ferrite bead. It's another thing that you can add. Um, essentially, this smooths out more noise. It kind of acts like an inductor and it smooths out noise in, with your, your current. Um, uh, honestly, I, I don't really know the inner workings of these, but um, I've been recommended that use something like this. A hundred, so this means it's going to act like a 100 ohms at 100 megahertz. So really, really high frequency noise is going to be um, suppressed by this. Once we get all that filtered out, um, we have a decoupling capacitor here, which is just recommended by this supplier, um, the people that make this chip. So you can imagine we have five volts coming in here to the VN. And then what this chip does is it steps it down to 3.3 volts for us. So bang. Um, and then we have an output capacitor, which just is going to keep this 3.3 volts smooth. You see, for pretty much any power pin, there's going to be a decoupling capacitor sitting on it. Um, yeah, again, just to smooth out the voltage. It's pretty common. So now for this analog pin here, we're taking this 3.3 volts, running it through another ferrite bead to smooth out some of the current and then a 100 nanofarad capacitor to smooth out some of that high frequency noise. And then a 10 nanofarad capacitor to smooth out even more of that high frequency noise. So the lower the uh, capacitance, the higher frequency noise that you're going to be um, filtering out. If you get a really big capacitor, like um, 20, microfarad or higher, then you start smoothing out the low frequency noise. And if anyone has done anything to do with like control systems or um, electrical device modeling, um, typically uh, it's related to the pole of the capacitor. So if you have a pole that's um, in like a Bode plot, if you push it all the way out to the right, um, then you're filtering the high frequency noise and the more left it moves, the more low frequency noise that you're going to be um, filtering out is out. Does the order matter? Um, I've, I've looked this up before because I had the same similar question. <clears throat> I can't remember if you have, you have to put the bigger one closer to the pin or the smaller one closer to the pin. Um, I want to say the smaller one closer to the pin, but um, you can probably just look it up. They'll probably explain it makes sense that the smaller one would be closer to the pin because high frequency noise is introduced easier to a circuit. So if you put the small one further away, then the noises might be introduced again. Um, but you probably have to double check that. I think that makes sense. Makes sense to me, I guess. So for this new um, STM, I'm just going to move things down here. <laughs> we can do the initial sort of stack up the same. So here we had one, two, three, four VDD. Here we have one, two, three, four VDD, but no VDD A, which is cool because this is a medical device that so probably needs more stability. Um, so basically we can just connect this like so. And copy across that. 3.3 volts. Oops. And that's a good start to powering this other chip. And now we have all of these VSSs. So VSS is just um, another word for ground. It's got something to do with um, transistors. So VDD is V drain, I think. Um, with a MOSFET, you have your gate, your source, and your drain, and VSS is um, your source, which apparently is connected to ground. More you know. Cool. Now, the other thing that 
Oh, this has a VREF here. All right, we won't worry about that. That might, that this might be our VDDA. Um, but so what ST do, they recommend a 2.2 microfarad capacitor on the, um, on the cap lines, on the cap pins. So we can just chuck those in. Wow, this is loading. Cool. Um, yes. And so something that we're going to set up, uh, if we just kind of circle this, <coughs> is we're going to turn on this um, oscillator circuit. So these devices have an internal clock reference, um, which basically you need to do any sort of electronics. It's just high, low, high, low, high, low. Um, but I think the internal clocks for these are RC circuits. And um, so it's just a resistor and a capacitor, which is charging, discharging. And they're not as stable as like a crystal oscillator, which uses a quartz crystal, um, which is resonating or, or vibrating really fast, producing a very clean clock, clock signal. And so what we want to utilize is this HSC out, uh, in and out, and connect an external oscillator. So that's one of the things we want to add. Um, SWO, SWDIO, SW clock. This is how we actually program it. Um, we're running out of time, so I'll just show. Uh, ST -Link. So before we can actually program over a USB, we have to first burn the code to tell it how to read over USB first. Um, and that's using one of these. And so these, you plug it into your computer, it's got pins out the back, and then we have to set it, this STM32 up so that it can read or um, understand that we are trying to program it from this kind of thing. Um, and if you guys remember in the first workshop, this is one of the devices that you can win when we do our competition towards the end of the semester. Anyway, I'm going to let this um, slowly unzip and I guess next week we'll get stuck into using this program. I download it for now. You can just go through um, your system core <clears throat> in, in um, connectivity. This tab we're going to want to turn on I2C um, and SPI. They're probably the most important um, communication protocols we're going to use for the moment. It's like I didn't download it faster but that's all right. We had a lot to cover this week. But for now, um, yeah, next week, I'm not going to touch these. I'm going to try finish up the rest of the circuit, interface the SD card, and then just have everything sort of ready to ready to route um, towards the end of the semester. But next week, we'll explain. Yeah, we'll explain this this whole system, how you write code for the STM32, swap over the processors, um, and then do some of the connectors. And what else do we have to add? Oh, we have to add a flash chip. Yeah, we should do that. Mm. Flash chip, uh, yeah, and buzzer and LED will do all of these. Maybe I'll do those over this week. Anyway, here's sort of like a, an overview of the schematic. <clears throat>